Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders, viewable on YouTube and M. Oppenheim TV. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing how the East Palo Alto Academy Foundation supports high school students through college and beyond with our special guests, Kate Heil, Executive Director, and Veronica Miranda Pinckney, the Interim Principal. It's just great to have you both here. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to having this discussion. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So East Palo Alto uh, Academy Foundation supports students through key years of, of attending high school, in advance of attending high school, and then, of course, in the aftermath of attending high school through those next years, regardless as to whether they take a vocational path or a uh, college track uh, path. Uh, Kate, could you talk a little bit about the kind of students that you serve and the kind of challenges that they confront? Absolutely. So, um, you know, and Veronica can speak to this too, but um, so East Palo Alto is a, a small, um, low-income, historically underserved community um, in the heart of Silicon Valley. And um, our students are, we have about 300 high school students, ninth through 12th grade, and they are 100% students of color. 88% um, of them are economically disadvantaged. Um, so they are a group who needs support and needs resources and needs care and love. And that's what EPAA provides. And let's not put too fine a point on it, Veronica. If you look at the history of the development of this area, it's been driven by uh, academic achievement. It's been driven by tech. And what's what's happened is, is that the populations have sorted as certain areas have become higher and higher rent areas, as jobs have sorted by education, What's, what's happened is East Palo Alto has basically been um, a, a place where people have moved to who have not been able to uh, to acquire those jobs and, and have those career tracks. Now, what you're doing is you're serving those, uh, those groups and helping them navigate their own future and, and an empowered future, aren't you? Absolutely. And I think that's definitely, we've definitely felt the effects of that, right, that we've had with COVID and everything else, our families moving out of the area. And so that's definitely affected our enrollment. But I think one of the big things, you know, our families, like 87% of them are like first generation. And so these are the families that mm -hmm. need the most services and that we're very um, honored to be able to provide the many services that we're able to, thanks to the generosity of the foundation. Well, let's also talk about that first generation point that you made, because what that means is that within the family, we're talking about uh, multilingual environments. We're talking about uh, um, uh, challenges in literacy, particularly literacy um, in um, in English, right, which is taught in the schools. Talk a little bit about how you navigate those situations and how, most importantly, the young children and uh, their parents navigate that because because there there come additional challenges with that multilingual um, uh, background. So absolutely. I think the key is education, that we have to provide uh, training and classes for our families because many of them do not know about the U.S. educational system and how things work. So having parent classes is very important. Like right now, we're so proud to be able to offer English classes to our community four nights a week um, because families need these skills. They need to learn the English language, right, in order to be able to get better opportunities. And so we're really proud to be able to do that. But also in the classroom, it's very very important to train our teachers in instructional strategies that support students that come to us speaking another language. And so that's something that our district has been very good about providing um, training so that teachers know how to meet the needs in the classroom. And then over the last two, three years, we've had a larger number we call of newcomers coming straight from another country, starting high school with absolutely no English. And so that's definitely been our challenge for our teachers. But again, having the proper training, and then we've invested in having like a bilingual resource teacher that helps coach our teachers and support them and follows our students to support their academic needs. That's also been a necessity for us. What countries and what languages are we are we talking about the majority of our language here? I mean, it's about our population is about 88 percent Latino. So it's Spanish. And so we usually it's, it's mainly Spanish here at our school. And it's mainly we have a lot. Mexico's a lot of Central America. And we have Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador are more um, prominent countries. So, uh, Kate, as you're hiring people, are you are you paying attention to ensuring that your staff are able to interact 
with your constituents so that if if we have language being a barrier, is it also a barrier in terms of interacting with you? So I think it's, so I think this is probably a question more for Veronica because she's the one who um, she's the school leader. So she hires all of the staff at the school. Um, and so so Veronica definitely. Um, okay. take that. <laughs> so I don't speak Spanish, Veronica. Would I be a good person to bring into your school environment as a teacher or as a, a, a as an administrator who is interacting with Spanish speaking parents? Absolutely. I mean, the questions, you know, like our interview process is geared, we have questions geared toward equity and multilingual skills. And so part of our interview process is making sure that we hire people that um, have cultural competency and that have instructional strategies that are going to support our students. So part of our hiring process includes questions about how do you support students who speak another language? And we ask them to explain it. And then we have them do model lessons because people can talk a good game and study, <laughs> you know, terms, but we actually put them in front of students to model lessons for us as part of their interview process. That's very rigorous. Um, and we take a lot of pride in that and making sure that we hire the right people that are going to work well with our communities and knowing the community and being able to relate to our families is the most important thing. You don't have to know Spanish. You just really need to care and take the time to learn and apply what you're learning with our community. That's a really interesting point. So I grew up in multilingual environments. I speak German and I, I grew up in, in environments where basically whenever we had people together, everybody was speaking different languages. It wasn't German and English. It was German, English, French, Spanish, you know, uh, Arabic, Hebrew. I mean, the whole, the whole panoply of different languages. Um, and, and so I guess I do have multicultural competencies, but... I don't speak any Spanish. So I guess if you were to hire people, you might be hiring me because I'm 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 competent in a multicultural uh, sense, but you couldn't just hire people like me because I don't have all the skills required to interact with your with your population. So you you need to balance, right? So not necessarily because we do have a lot of monolingual teachers who work here. The important uh -huh. thing is the training. And again, and that comes out when we look at your background, what is the training that you have? What certification that you have? And again, coming out in your interview and in the lessons that you do, because people go through lots of training, right, in order to meet the needs of our students. And so just because you don't speak Spanish, that does not disqualify you from being an amazing teacher. We have some amazing teachers that don't speak Spanish, but they're very skilled in the strategies that they have learned. They connect with the students, right? They have a deep mm -hmm. understanding of their challenges, and they do everything in their power to meet the needs of the students in their classroom. Yeah. And as a sadly, unfortunately, monolingual educator myself, um, who's worked in, you know, in South Central LA and East Palo, you know, uh, areas where I encountered a lot of Spanish speaking families, um, everyone was so gracious. Like as long as you care and as long as you want to help and they can tell that you, you know, that you care about their kid and that they, you care about their family. You know, I I've had full conversations where I speak English because I, that's what I'm comfortable speaking. They speak Spanish because that's what they're comfortable speaking. And we each understand enough and care enough about what we're talking about to get through it together. And so I think it's really just about you know, somebody showing up and really wanting to do this work. Yeah. So um, we've talked about the idea of caring and, and connection and cultural competencies. Let's talk a little bit about the programs that you provide, Kate, and the technical competencies that your staff have to bring to the table in order to provide those programs. Yeah, I think so. As a charter school, East Palo Alto Academy um, receives funding from the state, um, and it's enough basically to run a um, you know, a, a basic academic program. Um, and so what we're really proud to be able to do um, from the foundation perspective is to raise money for what would be really extras that shouldn't be considered extras. They're, they're commonplace in more affluent community schools. Um, these are things like, um, you know, college access services and programming, wraparound mental health services, athletics, 
clubs, you know, all of these things that really make a high school experience a holistic high school experience. That those are the types of things that we, you know, Dream Lab, Makerspace, those are the types of things that we have the opportunity to support with the funds that we raise um, as a foundation during the during the uh, students' high school years. And so that's really what our aim is: is to make sure that um, you know we're filling out <laughs> filling out that that like that basic academic program that you know that EPAA would it does a great job of of putting together with the funds that they have um but kind of filling that out and making it a holistic experience where a student has the support in case they're behind they have the acceleration if they are ahead they have enrichment to explore their passions you know they they have this this well-rounded high school experience um, and that's that's really where our 10 year promise to our students begins is the experience that they get to have in high school. Interesting, because each of us has our own individual needs. And if we come from uh, parents who are educated, already acclimated to the culture, um, we um, w- we have access to uh, resources within the home right. um, that help us navigate. So I had a really difficult time um uh, writing. Um, and, um, I didn't really speak until I was uh, quite old Mm -hmm. and reading was, it was difficult. It was difficult for me. I had all those advantages. Um, and what you're saying is that you have tried to provide a well-rounded experience to deal with children as individuals and not as sort of a mean average, um, uh, sort of, uh, whatever education unit right right a, a <laughs> no kid is a number at east Falls academy <laughs> so talk about how you ensure that you assess on an ongoing basis those needs and then respond to them because mm-hmm. the kids don't right the kids don't come in with a form and say uh here these are my needs right they no. they, they go to school and you're observing things right veronica and now you're trying to respond. How do you how do you deal with the fact that a child isn't able to necessarily articulate what they need to you? So I think that's the beauty of a smaller school that we can wrap mm-hmm. around our students and our services. And again, because of what we are provided with from the foundation, having extra staff to support our students, I think that's the key in that, you know, we have currently with 277 students with two counselors. Most most larger high schools have a caseload of about three, 400 students. And so they get personalized attention from their counselors. They have an advisor that follows them for two years and that really gets to know our students and assess some of those needs. And those advisors are so key for our students. They're the one assessing the Mm -hmm. situation and advocating and reaching out to their other teachers, reaching out to counselors, reaching out for support for them. And so that's how we keep track of our students. It's that personalized attention that they can get at a small school that unfortunately doesn't happen in the larger schools. And we wouldn't be able to do it with the support of the foundation if we just strictly had, you know, our state funding. And so um, it's just awesome to be a part of that team that's able to discuss students like we have, we call it a care team, the therapist, the counseling department, administrators coming together, discussing students and figuring out what are the needs and reaching out immediately. Like we are sitting in our meetings, like so-and-so needs therapy, let's refer them. So-and-so needs to have a parent meeting because they're not understanding that they're off track to graduate. So we call for those parent meetings right away. Like even right now, all of our teachers are meeting with families. We call uh, student-led conferences. They're meeting, connecting with the families, make sure they know that whether they're on track or not and what they need to do. And so I think that's just one of the really good things that we use, the, the personal connection, small environment to keep our kids on track. Kate, talk a little bit about your funders and, and the resources that um, end up assisting people. Because if I'm a person of low income and I am a recipient of your services, then by definition, I can't necessarily fund them myself. So how does this work? How do I get to benefit from the largesse of your donors? And who are those donors? Yeah, so we we exist because of a an extremely generous um, community of donors um, who you know take part in our work um, through their support. So it, our budget comes mostly from um, individual donors. Um, so individual donors, families, family foundations, but also we get grants from community organizations and things like that as well. 
So in terms of in terms of of what's going on here um, in the United States, um, education is funded by property taxes, right? So we're talking about uh, a area and schools that really are not sufficiently funded using that mechanism. So is is what's going on that people in neighboring uh, areas who might be wealthier are looking at their neighbors and saying, you know something, we, all of us, need to help these children and make sure that these children are are, are cared for? Is that is that really what's going on? Are we talking about neighbors helping neighbors? That's what I believe is happening. Is neighbors ha- helping neighbors? You know, most of our most of our individual donors are local donors who see you know the whole community <laughs> and want to make sure that the whole community has the support that they need. Veronica, how do you see it? Absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm fairly new to my role, but in the short time from what I've seen and meeting some of the donors, just knowing that they really care about the students in the community. And I just think that, you know, seeing that the inequities is what drives them um, to support our students, to making sure that we have opportunities. Just in my first board meeting that I had, you know, reaching out, asking for support, you know, we need this, we need to make sure we have a library and somebody stepping up immediately saying, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't have a librarian? I'm going to pay for it. And so it's like they see the school in their neighborhood has has it and they want to make sure that all schools have it. And so it's a beautiful thing to see that they're willing to give so that all of our students can have the same things. It can get very personal. So I, I did some work for Lorene Powell Jobs uh, a while back and um, she founded College Track also in uh, EPA and in, in other uh, areas. Um, that was just a personal um, uh, passion of hers is to ensure that there's educational equity. And her point was is that you don't get entree into this economy unless you have a certain level of, uh, of education. It's everybody's responsibility. Is that how your donors feel? I, I mean, I don't want to speak for them, but it, it sure does seem like that is what's driving, um, you know, our our community of donors. Because like I said, they, they are local donors. They are seeing that they're the schools where their children attend or attended have these Um, you know, what I called at the beginning extras that shouldn't be extras that aren't extras at, you know, at these schools. And, and every child deserves to have that kind of high school experience. Every child deserves to have the support they need to, you know, achieve their goals. And so that is what, you know, again, I don't want to speak for them. But you know, when I speak to donors, that is what is driving, um, you know, the individuals who support our now, things have changed over the last years, particularly with COVID and the cost of, of higher ed and, and so on. And so what, what is happening right now in the education space is that uh, young people, their parents um, and educators are uh, reaching the conclusion that maybe this sort of very traditional uh, go to high school, graduate, uh, maybe go to community college, go to a four-year college, and, and that entire sort of college track idea, that that might not be the only way that there's a vocational uh, approach to education that can not only be for for, uh, elements uh, or careers like the trades, you know, plumbers and and people who build and so on and so forth, but also in tech, right? (laughs) Vocational uh, training that basically moves into tech. And that might be a as a matter of fact, a more cost-effective approach, a better approach in terms of Mm -hmm. careers. Talk about how you have adjusted over the last years to include those types of approaches. Yeah, absolutely. And so, of course, you know, there, there is the cost element to it. There's the, 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 you know, the rising cost of college. Um, But there's also this idea that, you know, it, it isn't, college isn't for everyone. There is definitely, you know, our society operates um, it's at its best when everybody is playing their part and everybody's part is different. You know, there, we, we need all sorts of different roles in a society. And so I think that um, when we focus um, on the bachelor's degree, um, and we do we do that because you know people in you know, people who work in college access we focus on the the bachelor's degree because it continues to be the most powerful lever of upward mobility nobody's saying it's not it is um however it isn't the only lever and when we just focus on the bachelor's degree we end up alienating students who you know 
maybe can't afford it for sure, but also may not see themselves in jobs that require a bachelor's degree. Maybe well, they also it that. might not be a particular uh, reset path, right? People can right. take longer, can get a, pa- a bachelor's degree later on in life. Absolutely. I've even seen people skip the bachelor's degree entirely and go to a master's education for uh, certain programs that allow that by wow. by uh, giving um, um, educational credit for career experience and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. It basically is a way to circumvent these sort of standard routes. Veronica, what do yeah. you see in terms of your students and what they need and what their parents need and what their families need? How How does that cause you to adjust how you how you provide educational services? Well, I definitely, I think Kate, you know, even mentioned it, right? And so like the shift that the foundation has had on making sure to support our students, because I believe when we look at the data from last year, the graduating class, it was evenly split. The students that were pursuing, you know, the four-year college and going to trade school, going to community college. And so we've definitely had to adjust. We have a class senior seminar where our teacher does a phenomenal job preparing our students. And so he's making sure like this semester students are in class. They're learning all about, they're going through their application process right now. I was just and they're observing, they're making sure to get their academic profile, letters of recommendation, and they're gearing for the big job, right, to turn in those applications. And the next semester, students that have chosen the path to go to trade school or community college will take their senior seminar where all of his instruction is geared for them and what their needs are. And so there's definitely been a big shift in the last few years, and our teachers are having to adjust their instruction to meet their needs and not make it like a side thing. That's, I think, one thing that I really appreciate, right? It's like, it's equally important important and we're going to make sure you have a class just for you to meet your needs. And 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 the careers are also shifting, right? I mean, if, if you look at what we used to learn, we used to learn a lot of stuff that in the future people will no longer be doing, but there are things that people will always be doing. You cannot do hands-on care for somebody else, an elder or a child. You can't do that by machine. You can't do right. that by, by AI. You can't build... Um, uh, uh, materials with the flexibility that, are, that to a machine that a person can, can bring to the job. So we're talking about a whole range of skills that are not necessarily in a four-year college curriculum. Mm-hmm. But those skills start today, right, Veronica? I mean, even the whole idea of applying and, and filling out the appropriate paperwork and then appearing at, at a job site and interviewing in a way that creates the connection. Is that part of what you're what you're providing to your students? Absolutely. I mean, it starts in elementary school. Everything you need in life, you learn in kindergarten, right? And I think just here when they come to us, we just had a conversation yesterday in our department chair meetings about teaching students essential skills of organization, organizing their backpack, using their planners, time management. Like these are skills that they need in whatever executive job. function, time management, yeah, right? Yes. Being on time and showing up and being prepared. Responsibility right? with homework, right? Just all of these skills are things that you want to make sure that they walk away here with. with because no matter where they go or what they do, they need these essential, you know, executive executive functioning skills, as we call them. So let's say I've now graduated high school. Mm-hmm. Not, uh, I'm not in high school anymore. Do you still help me? Absolutely. <laughs> that is where our foundation alumni programs um, come in, and so that's where we sort of take over. And actually, we we. Um, we start kind of the process of relationship building and bridging um, in senior seminar. Um, So our foundation um, staff, support staff goes into senior seminar and starts to build those relationships. We're really lucky to be part of this community so that we can provide this continuum of care. Um, But there's a lot to navigate after you graduate high school. And so uh, we provide scholarships and staff support um, for all those little questions, you know, all the, all that paperwork, all that, what building, what, you know, what building do I need to go to? What do I need? What do I say in this interview? If they ask this, you know, we, we just kind of, we try to be there to catch all of those, you know, all of those uncertainties and all of those little questions and to really help students navigate whatever their next step is after high school. And so we have programs that um, support students who are at four-year universities um, pursuing their bachelor's degree. We have a program uh, for students at community college or in trade school. Um, And we're just really lucky to be able to offer 
scholarships to students, particularly mostly um, for students who are at four universities because of the cost of attendance <laughs> um, at universities. But we also just recently were able to, to start um, a scholarship program for students who are in these full-time trade programs, because that's one of the things that we learned with this shift is that these trade programs are full-time a lot of the time. Um, so they're shorter, but they're full time. And so if a student needs to work to support themselves and their families and they're working 30 or 40 hours a week, it doesn't feel possible to do a full time program without financial support for those basic needs. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to offer that kind of financial support now so that a student can feel like these full time trade programs are an option if that's where they're being being pulled. Um, you know, if that's where their heart is, is telling them to go. Well, this is this is really uh, phenomenal. Let's talk a little bit about what comes next. So Veronica and then uh, Kate, if you could uh, wrap us up. Uh, Veronica, in terms of what you'd like to be doing in the future in this next year in 2025 coming up, um, how would you like to uh, better support your your clients, your students, your kids, their families. How do how, how do we make things better every year? I think it's definitely building on what we have going. We have so many amazing things that are happening at our school site. And I just really think building on those things. And I think the most important thing is just not letting um, our staff um, forget, like, why do we exist? Right. We exist because of the students. We are here to serve our students and to provide services and things that they normally would not have access to. And so I think that's one of my biggest things as interim principal is making sure that we're meeting the needs of our students and that all the decisions that are made, it's because it's benefiting our students and it's going to improve our community. And like I said, you know, having the English classes for our families, bringing our families on site to educate them and to make them a par partners with you know, there's child education is really important to me because I feel like that's the key, right? That's the key to our your first generation students and our families. Like they hold all their hopes and dreams are in these students, right? And so I just really hope that we're able to not forget why we exist and can really support our students. That's a wonderful sentiment. Kate, um, what would you like to be doing uh, going into the future? Do you need to scale? Do you need to provide new services? Um, how yeah, do you great. see the future? Great question. You know, we're we're really, um, you know, we love being part of this. You know, this small this small community. We 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 serve the students and alumni of East Palo Alto Academy, um, East Palo Alto Academy, and but I think you know my my goal is that students graduate from East Palo Alto Academy um, excited and ready for their next step and know that they have a place to land and see our alumni programs, um, see a place for themselves in our alumni programs. You know, I right now we, you know, each year we have more and more students joining our programs and we're almost there, but I am going for a hundred percent. I want a hundred percent of alumni to see a place for themselves in our alumni programs because they have found the place that they they feel like they belong after high school and they know what they want um, to pursue or at least what they want to try um, and what feels good for them because they've had the opportunity to explore that in high school um, and they've had the support to um, to follow their passion um, and to go where they want to go. One thing that really comes through for me listening to you and having the pleasure of, of asking you my questions is that you both see that it's one more child it's not one more male child or female child. It's not one one more child who identifies in, in whatever way they identify. It's not uh, Latino or black or white or, or anything else. It's one more child. It's one more family. It's basically meeting people where they are, trying to be good neighbors, trying to help out where we can. And we are that powerful. We can just do a little bit more. We can change someone's life. It's just such a wonderful, wonderful story that you have to tell. Kate Heil, Executive Director, and, and Veronica Miranda Pinckney, Interim Principal of the East Palo Alto Academy. Please, please, please thank your staffs, your educators, your donors, and most importantly, members of the community, your kids, right? These young adults who are striving to be adult and their families. It is just such a wonderful, wonderful uh, story that you have to tell. Thank you so much for sharing it. 
Thank you so much for having us and allowing us to share our story. Um, it's it's really their stories. Um, and um, we're just lucky ambassadors. So thank you. Um, thank you for having us. And Veronica, thank sorry. <laughs> thank you. It's it, it's an honor. Just really appreciate being able to share. Um, you know, I think when I started, I share like, I feel like I am my students, right? First generation immigrant, English learner. And so I just see myself so much in my students. And it's just such an honor to be here representing and advocating for my students on a daily basis. Wonderful. Thank you.